Um, Michael, 14 years ago you interviewed me. Uh, 14. 14 years ago you for were, a job. You were so but a child. Now, now finally, you were um, but a child. still, still, yeah, yeah. but a child. <laughs> um, <laughs> now it's my time to interview you. So thank you for being here today. Um, First and foremost, I know everyone's probably seen this, um, and particularly in travel, fascinating order. So Ryanair ordered 300 new aircraft. Um, and I remember a number of years ago reading an article where an analyst st said that Ryanair was going to run out of runway in Europe for growth. So what is the big strategy or grand plan behind the 300 aircraft, and where is the growth going to go into? I joined Ryanair in 1997, we had uh, nine routes and three million passengers. So since 1998, I've been hearing that low-cost travel is saturated in Europe. Uh, and we're still hearing it, of course, and it's not true, because the, uh, the capacity of low fares to stimulate travel is just... Well, we, we haven't seen the end of it. We haven't seen the end of it anywhere, in fact. Uh, even in the US, the most mature market of all, Southwest has kind of gone native with high fares now. But there are many airlines around the track, like Spirit, Frontier, um, Avello, and many others in the States, which are stimulating traffic in the most mature market where they've had low fares since 1970. So on a, on a per head basis of population, uh, we're way behind the US in terms of the amount of traffic that's flying. Allied to the fact that post-COVID, legacy carriers are operating at a uh, less than 100%. In fact, some of them are less than 80% of their pre-COVID short-haul capacity, particularly Lufthansa, Air France, and to a lesser extent, British Airways. But, uh, so the opportunity is obvious for the gaps, in the gaps that they've left alone. But the stimulative effect of uh, low fares on on uh, travel in countries, just to give you an example. So, for example, in Spain, where you have about 45 million people, now we know there, there's a lot of travel into Spain, um, you know, the, the passenger traffic, as compared with the air traffic, as compared with Poland, for example, which is not necessarily an attractive um, holiday destination in the same way Spain is, but it's a, in a very attractive outbound population. I see the the disposable income for Poles has now risen from $12,700 in 2005 to $27,800 in the current year, ahead of the UK, um, with 8% compound growth in the last 15 years. So there are already markets, 38 million Poles there, and the level of flying there, uh, the, the number of air, 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 um, air travel seats and passengers, correspondingly, is probably about a sixth of what it is in Spain, if not less. So the propensity and the potential to grow just in that country alone. And add the Ukraine to it, Michael O'Leary has spoken quite a lot about the Ukraine. We had started, in fact, in the Ukraine uh, prior to the, the uh, outbreak of the war. And um, the potential there with 40 million people is even more in the, the medium to long term. Coupled with the fact that in markets where we have a huge market share, like Italy, for example, yeah. We are already, we're putting in, I think, up to 10 extra aircraft into Italy this year without any discernible effect on fares. In fact, fares are going up, generally. So demand is extremely robust and just seems to be, I won't say infinite, but it's a long, long runway to go. The other interesting thing, which is lost on a lot of commentators about that's this current order is that these are larger aircraft. They're 20% mm. larger. I was larger. going to ask that. How does that affect And 25% of operating. the growth from the end of the current order, i.e. 225 million passengers, to 300, 25 to 33 percent of that growth, a quarter to a third of that growth, is merely putting bigger aircraft on existing routes. Yeah. Um, so, you know, everybody talks about the Canaries and we're full on every flight to the Canaries or Faro or yeah. Malaga or any of these very well-known routes. Uh, there's two solutions to, fill, to that. In the interim, obviously, fares go up. Uh, but in the longer term, as we have more capacity on existing uh, routes by dint of putting bigger aircraft on, fares will fall, inevitably. Uh, and um, they'll give us, at slot congested airports, of which there's an increasing number, uh, the ability to move 20% more passengers for every movement we make. So, like, there's a very virtuous allied to the fact, by the way, that there's a 16% reduction in fuel consumption uh, and the cost of staffing the aircraft. You have two pilots, you have one extra cabin crew member, but you have, you know, 20, 23, 24 extra seats. So it is, a, it is a very substantial saving for us, which in turn will be passed on to passengers because it, it will, we'll have to lower fares, inevitably, to fill the bigger aircraft. But we're very happy to do that. 
How much does the bigger aircraft impact the operations? Because when I was in Ryanair, it was 189 seats, every plane. Now you're moving to different seat layout, different number of passengers to turn around, different number of seats to clean. Does that have an operational impact, or is it, is uh, it offset well, when by I, the growth? Before your time in Ryanair, we moved from 130 to 189 okay. seats seamlessly. Okay. Uh, literally seamlessly. Everybody worried about the 25-minute turnaround, and it. Yeah. Uh, it was as good or improved, in fact, uh, yeah. the punctuality with the larger aircraft. I think everything is, a bit, uh, is, is about being ready mm -hmm. when the aircraft arrives at the airport. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, passengers are ready, passengers are, are uh, checked in at the gate uh, and uh, are ready to board. Uh, frankly, we'll have an extra, an extra um, door, access door on these aircraft. We'll have an extra cabin crew when it comes mm -hmm. to cleaning and getting the aircraft ready. So in general terms, there's nothing to, if we get the logistics right, which we're pretty good at generally, mm. uh, if we, even if we have a few trial runs at it that mm. mightn't work out at the mm. start, generally we're pretty good at uh, organizing these kind of things. And I don't have any qualms that we'll still be turning around with most of those aircraft in 25 minutes. In reality, the thing that inhibits Ryanair from 25 minute turnarounds is congestion at airports. Mm. It's not, it's getting to the gate and getting away from the gate. Mm. Uh, that's the issue. Yeah. And uh, you know we all know the trials of uh, air traffic control, etc. Mm. So I don't think the size of the aircraft is going to inhibit us doing that. And when Ryanair is looking at its strategy, so obviously you're on the board. So when it comes to signing off an aircraft order of this scale, I won't ask you how much you paid for them, but I expect there was a discount Tell given. You, but I have to shoot <laughs> um, what like is there anyone out there in Europe, any other airlines, or like or is there any other airlines you admire what they're doing, or Ryanair would feel slightly threatened by? Well, I admire a lot of different airlines uh, for different reasons, but yeah. none of them are in the low-cost space that we're in. I mean, I admire British Airways in terms of being profitable. Yeah. Uh, it's, the customer experience is uh, perhaps doesn't, you know, yeah. uh, it, it depends how far you're flying with them and in what business or in what uh, uh, passenger class you're flying with them. For her, I admire Emirates, for example, as an airline. Um, but as a business, mm. and as a business that's focused exclusively on what it is, what what it does, and in 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 uh, excelling and optimizing the opportunity in that sphere, uh, Ryanair has, is peerless, you know? It has no comparators in Europe now, now that Wizz Air has turned its attention elsewhere. Yeah. And Wizz Air, it's not just the turning of attention, it's the ne necessary turning of attention. I mean, they've, they tried to attack us uh, commercially in uh, Italy in the last couple of years, and they found they can't compete. Mm -hmm. They don't have a brand, uh, they don't have a cost base, and they don't have an infrastructure mm -hmm. uh, that's sustainable in the way that we have. And uh, now they're turning their attention elsewhere mm. uh, in the face of that. But they're a good airline in yeah. many, many respects. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it would be wrong of me to say that if somebody isn't good, it hasn't low cost, that they're not a good airline. That's not true. Mm. But they're not going to compete in the low airline space. They're not yeah. going to. So, for example, over 40% of Ryanair's routes are economic monopolies. Nobody's ever flown them before. Mm. Nobody will ever fly them before because they depend on a cost structure on a, which supports a fare uh, to the customer which then drives the demand that's sufficient to fill a plane on a right route from Knock to Alicante, for example, mm. or Kerry to Frankfurt Han, or, you know, uh, Frankfurt Han to Porto, for example. Nobody's ever flown those before, nobody ever will, because they're a function of the economics, of the cost base in the first place, and primarily the demand is a function of the price. And, you know, when airports or any other suppliers to us are partners, euphemistically partners, mm of ours, forget that, yeah. that there's a point at which you can begin to rod your customers because now you have them and they inevitably have to, pass. that's the day the, the whole model fails. Uh, and you know, some airports misunderstand that. They feel that customers, once they fly, are captive and you can just put up the cost and the yeah. price. You can't do that. Yeah. And you know, if there's, we're not good at, we're good at a very small defined number of things, but I would suggest we're very good at taking the maximum that can be taken from customers. But that still may not be enough to satisfy uh, the demands of partners who believe their costs are, or don't believe their costs are excessive and don't join the, you know, the efficiency train that's leaving the station, if you like, that we, that we demand. So you know, at least those 40% of routes, uh, they're not 40% of capacity now, because necessarily they're smaller routes, mm -hmm. but, um, but they are a considerable amount of activity which wouldn't exist if we didn't secure low costs marry them to our own low costs internally, mm -hmm. most efficient mm -hmm. airlines, in terms of buying aircraft, mm -hmm. operating efficiently, 25 minutes, all those, the whole model that everybody knows. Mm -hmm. You marry the two of those together, 
And then you find that if you offer a fare at which you make a reasonable return, the demand will come. That makes a new route. And it's, it's only that marriage that makes it happen. And I think that unbelievably after operating for in the low cost space and since I joined in 1997, what's that, 20, 30 years now, you know, 20, 25, 20, 28 years, people still don't understand that. Mm. Uh, partners of ours, people who profess to understand the business. They should be doing business with another airline, mm. not with us. And if you think of that perfect marriage in terms of the operational excellence and the cost base, you know, why did you never pursue the transatlantic opportunity? You stuck to Europe, but if you're able to take what you're good at and apply it to longer haul routes, I know obviously different type of aircraft, etc. but why is it not something that you went after? We looked at transatlantic, we've, uh, we've looked at it a few times, uh, and um, there are a couple of issues. Number one, the transatlantic market is not a particularly big market. That's the first thing to say, right? Um, there are, uh, like when you compare it to what, you know, would you put 10 aircraft on transatlantic in the morning like we've done into Italy? Mm. We've added 50 to the whole network this year. You might saturate the, the transatlantic market in reality with about 25 aircraft. So it's not a massive, massive opportunity. That's the first thing to say. There are significant in, uh, prohibitions and, and inhibiting factors at airports in the US, for example, like, you know, the whole passport and all, all, the, all the visa issues that, that are impediments to travel that the, the free freedom of skies in Europe has eliminated, right? Uh, so it's not a quick decision for people to go. Um, but most importantly for us is we cannot get the efficiencies that we get by nickeling and diming on 25 minute turnarounds. If you have a seven hour sector length, there's no point in, you know, there's no advantage in getting an extra five minutes by turning around the aircraft in 25 minutes as against 30 minutes because you can't fit in another seven hour one on the back of the two, 25, the two five minute savings you make at either end of the flight. We can do that if we have six sectors a day, we might get a seventh mm. because we save five minutes in each of, or 10 minutes in each of those turnarounds. Mm. Um, so that doesn't apply. Um, and also the whole model of low cost economy travel in the US, like if you examine the per mile cost transatlantic that is charged to a customer on average, mm. it's much less than short haul in Europe, mm. legacy people because it's supported by business class passengers at the front of the cabin. Yeah. And you, we can't, we wouldn't have business class passengers. If we had, we would have had to have business class passengers. Yeah. And frankly, we no, wouldn't know business not. class passengers <laughs> if we saw, <laughs> jumped up and bit us. So, A different type you know, of passenger, yeah. um, uh, we, our, our, our computer doesn't accommodate those kind of failures, yeah. frankly. <laughs> so, so we're, we're uh, that's, that's the yeah. economics don't, uh, just don't add up to us. But, but most importantly, in my view, in the front end, and. You know, Mike would have another view of it, and some of the other people in Minor would have another view of the cost issue, which is important. The market isn't that exciting, frankly. Mm. Yeah. You know, uh, if you take a couple of the cities out, which are pretty well served, you know, New York, Orlando, Chicago, um, you know, you'd be really get into secondary yeah. destinations. Yeah. And like with the with the, uh, they're pretty well served at the moment as well by the A321 yeah. extended range. You know, yeah. I mean, Dublin remarkably, if you were to take Dublin as a, I think Dublin, can he correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the is it the fourth best served city in Europe from North America? Yeah, that's fourth or more fifth. To do that's with remarkable the, for a city of its size. That's more to do with pre-clearance, mm? no? Is I mean, bigger than Rome, bigger than Madrid, bigger yeah. than. Copenhagen, bigger than uh, you know any of the Eastern European capitals, many of which are much, much bigger cities. Barcelona, for example, much bigger cities than, than Dublin. Um, it, the service into the city is remarkable from North America and vice versa, obviously. And Ryanair recently has had a few initial wins in the courts mm. with some of the challenges of what went on during COVID and government supports for some airlines. Ryanair um, obviously got no support, and you know, I mm. think your view would be because you guys had built up your own strong balance sheet. Like, how important is that to Ryanair? And the rel I'm sure there's a massive cost associated with this pursuit. Yeah, I mean, we're out of money from from having taken those cases. Yeah, we're not yeah. going to get a we're not going to get no. repaid. It's not it's not us that's the beneficiary. In reality, the the I mean, the cases are a little bit different from one another. Um, yeah. In the case of the German uh, Lufthansa, they have repaid the money to the German government, but they did. They needed the money urgently and couldn't get it from anywhere else during COVID. Um, SAS have not repaid the money uh, and neither, surprise, surprise, has ITA or mm -hmm. Alitalia as yeah. it used to be. They've never repaid any money to anybody. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, to a certain extent, uh, but it's not a Pyrrhic victory. It's very, very important, uh, um, first of all, to uh, establish that the EU Commission has a deeply flawed uh, approach to these yeah. kind of things. Um, 
in just waving them by, depending mm. on particular countries and particular airlines that approach them, you know? Uh, we, uh, we genuinely need to have open competition here. Now, to be reali the, the reality is, you know, um, the competition that we have with the likes of Lufthansa and Alitalia and SAS, we're very easy, we're yeah. easy to cope. What, what, what is the, 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 the if you like, unintended consequence yeah. of this assistance is that Lufthansa never gets efficient. Yeah, okay. So it really is a bonus for us that yeah. they get this money yeah. in, a, in a contorted way. Yeah. But we will always fight for the, the, uh, to reinforce the idea that you must have a level playing pitch when it comes yeah. to, Aviation. like in other, in other spheres, for example, the whole, the whole hypocritical approach by the EU Commission in relation to carbon and um, the, you know, the charges at places like uh, Schiphol, for example, who are the most hypocritical bunch in Europe, they, they charge um, uh, for, for uh, emissions on all short haul, except the short haul that feeds long haul. And they don't charge for long okay. haul. And long haul is responsible for 80% of all the emissions. It's absurd, mm -hmm. you know? And Mr. Tinnemans, in the, uh, who's Dutch, in the, uh, in the commission, is the, was the, uh, is the leading environmental commissioner. And he's a complete hypocrite when it comes to this. I have no problem saying that. And to see him pontificate at in Glasgow and in where else in Egypt, they had the, the uh, COP2022, 20, was it, 24, um, is a joke, you know? Uh, they're, they're, this is a direct penalty on low-fare airlines and on non-transfer non, um, airlines in and out of Skipball and right across Europe for the more general application. The Dutch government are replicating what the... Uh, and di directly subsidizing because 50% of all the traffic that KLM have at Skipball is transfer traffic. Mm. So if they were genuine, we have no problem with emissions uh, taxation, but it needs to be a level playing pitch for everybody. So if we'll fight that good fight and we'll continue to do it. And it's great to get victories. Good morale boost for yeah. the lawyers. Yeah, Julius is they delighted. <laughs> um, so if you to pick one thing and bar the people of Ryanair, because obviously Gavin, Greg, Kenny X, Ryanair are all here, but um, what do you believe is the single, single biggest driver to Ryanair's success? Like it is an unbelievable aviation success story. So what do you think if you to pick one thing? Well, I think it's the focus on the same thing. I, I yeah. mean, I've... Uh, the day I went in there in 1997, I was in there with Michael the week before last. Uh, we had a board meeting, and uh, cost is the single yeah. biggest item. Like yeah. it, cost is at every single uh, agenda, uh, at the agenda for every single item. How do we do something? And you know, cost reduction is innovation by another name. Uh, and not everybody wants to talk about cost reduction. They want to talk about innovation. Let's talk about innovation. Let's try and get more outputs for the for same inputs, or the same outputs for less inputs, or the optimum, more outputs for less inputs. That's what cost reduction is. That's mm. what innovation is. Mm. A better, more efficient way of doing something. Mm. So we, other people call it innovation, we call it cost reduction. Mm. Um, and that's what we're about all the time. We're aided and abetted in the airline business, and the only other comparable business is, is uh, mobile phone usage, where the demand is, is price elastic. Mm. Not everybody can grow a business by reducing the cost of the product. Mm. Uh, you may displace a competitor, but you won't grow the market with bread or beer even in this country if you reduce the price. Mm. Um, uh, but you will with air travel, uh, and you will with mobile phone usage, as we, we know. Um, so we're lucky in that regard that what we're good at can stimulate the market yeah. as well as gaining a competitive advantage. Yeah. And I mean, we've never lost focus on that. Everybody, no. everybody who's worked there, Kenny and the lads, will tell you that, and you know yourself, uh, it is a pain in the neck to listen to Ryanair mm. people, yeah. but it, that's what it's all about. We can call it innovation if it gets us the cost reduction. We don't care, but we need to get the cost but reduction. But people would say to me, oh, God, you worked in Ryanair. Was that not, a, like, that has no culture? You know, and I say Ryanair has one of the strongest cultures I've ever experienced for a business. It has a through and through low-cost culture, and that is the strong It doesn't suit everybody. Culture. It doesn't suit everybody, but somebody who's prepared, you know, for a challenge and for, um, I think, an intellectual challenge, frankly, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. go and follow it. You're given mm -hmm. the chance to do something better than the way we do it mm -hmm. because we, we will never arrive at the destination where we've optimized the product or, indeed, you know, the proposition or, mm -hmm. or ever reduce the price, you know? I mean, the, to, a contention that I would have is, like, travel initiates economic activity in Europe, in a certain time, speaking from a European point of view, and it's, it's true, I'm involved in an airline in Argentina, and I'm involved in one in the US as well, and it's true, air travel in particular 
stimulates um, economic activity. So if you can create more of it by lowering the price of it, you're stimulating economic activity. Some people get that equation the other way around. Now, it seems to me that the added value that Ryanair, as the ultimate stimulant of low-fare activity and, and new airline activity and travel in Europe, is getting a very small, small share of the added value that it adds. So, for example, if you take an average punter going for even a weekend away, as distinct from a, a two-week holiday, they will spend possibly seven, eight hundred, a thousand euro today between accommodation, car hire, uh, and entertainment, uh, food, drink, the whole lot, and the airfare. What proportion is it of, the, of that? All that added value, which has only arisen because you have a lower airfare. Ryanair is still getting less than its fair share of that. You mightn't agree with that, no, Kenny, on the other side. No. But, but that it's is absolutely the case. <laughs> absolutely the case. And, you know, people who, who build property in holiday destinations will tell you. Mm. You go to Malta uh, and look at the, the development that's happened there. I was in Malta when they had, you know, uh, they were on their knees with tourism in 2009, and before that, indeed. And... Uh, the, you may not like the development that's happened there. Some would argue there's been overdevelopment, perhaps. But, but there's been development. Uh, just as a microcosm of what's happened in hundreds of destinations around Europe. Stimulated by low traffic, by low fare, by low cost travel. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's no getting away from that. So, like, that's, that's, that is, to my mind, a uh, fund that we haven't tapped into at all. Yeah. Maybe when we reach 300 million passengers, we should yeah. turn around and start getting our fair share of, the <laughs> of, of what's created. But we're not there yet. Greg and Gavin are a bit nervous by Absolutely. that. Absolutely. New yeah. targets. <laughs> we'll pass them with that next Monday morning. Yeah. I have, just to finish off, five very quick fire questions. Um, I hope I, I might know the answer to one or two of these, so I might get some, some help. But um, just to see how well you know Ryanair. <laughs> um, in what year was the first Ryanair flight? 85. 85. Yeah. yeah. What is the seat capacity of a 747? We've already mentioned this. 500? No. 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 Sorry, of a 737. 737? Seven, seven. Yeah. Which one? 737. Well, there's a few of those now. Yeah. The 200s were 130. Yeah, okay. The, the, the eight, 800s were 189, and the new one is 197. I'm just and keeping the new you on your toes, Michael. It's not that this is written down is wrong here, it's I'm keeping you on your toes. Yeah. Um, who has a smaller cost base, Ryanair or Wiz? Rainer. Right. And the final one is, do you know when the French air traffic control will ever stop striking? <laughs> I have to put I the do, trip I to do, Disney. I do, I do, I do. <laughs> August, when their holidays come. Oh, yeah, okay. That's yeah. the best time Always. to go but to Paris. Always, but they're back again at it in September. Yeah, all right, okay. Yeah. They take a break. You watch for, for, for French bank holidays, and when they go on holidays, uh, 14th of July, they will not strike because they're on holidays themselves. Well, listen, thank there you, are. Michael. Pleasure. Thank you for taking the questions today. Thank you. Okay, well done. Thanks very much. Thanks, Michael. Thank you.